Good afternoon, almost good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sushant Palakoti Rao. I'm the senior director responsible for this very dynamic and exciting region of which, about which we're going to hear shortly. And before I pass over to Farid to chair this exciting panel, I just wanted to share one very small anecdote with you. When I started at the World Economic Forum nine years ago as part of a leadership program, uh, there's a person on the stage who agreed, I don't know why, to serve as my, my mentor. And at that time he told me, I'm a person who believed in ASEAN long before ASEAN believed in itself. And he made it his goal to make sure that I became a believer and that I also got the forum to believe in this region. And since that time over the years, we have done some very exciting things. We have taken our annual regional summit that takes place every May or June to countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and most recently to Myanmar, uh, which this year will be chairing ASEAN. And I think it shows um, how much we now believe in ASEAN. It's here uh, in a very strong way. And we're very excited uh, that this discussion will all be connected to the summit that will, for the first time, be held in the Philippines uh, on May 21st to the 23rd. And we have the Special Envoy, President Aquino, here with us uh, to speak to that as well. So with that in mind, uh, a welcome to our panel. And thank you very much, Farid. My pleasure. I don't think I need that unless... Uh... <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is... Uh, I think we, what we're going to try to do with this panel is to try and make it as substantive and interactive. Uh, no prepared statements, no, f no formalism. There is no reporting press allowed in the room. So I hope you will all take that as an opportunity to, to really get into some of the, you know, some of the questions and, and issues. You know, the, the great puzzle when looking at Asia is this. If you look at international relations and you say to yourself, when was the last time you saw a group of countries that were close to one another, growing very fast, all growing at rates of 3 4 5%, that had different kinds of political regimes, that had historical problems with one another, that had histories of conflict with one another, some unresolved border issues or sovereignty issues, but very vigorous economic growth. That place would have been Europe in 19, the 19th century. And what you had was 150 years of war, almost continuous war. So the question is, why is Europe's past not going to be Asia's future? As you have all these Asian countries growing fast, with military budgets growing <laughs> very fast, Many major Asian countries are spending 10% 10, 10 plus uh, uh, increases in their defense budget year on year. They have different political regimes. They have different uh, economic systems in some cases. They certainly have border issues. They certainly have sovereignty issues. If you look at Europe today, what made Europe overcome its past was the memory of World War I and II, extraordinary uh, uh, reconciliation that France and Germany went through, and the European Union, which created economic inter interdependence. Asian countries have no history of World War I and World War II to overcome in that, in, in that sense. They were not the deep destructive wars. Uh, they do not have the great reconciliation that France and Germany went through, unless I have missed something in the Japanese-Chinese relationship in the last few uh, weeks. In fact, you could argue that Japan and China stand in stark contrast to the reconciliation that, that France and Germany went through. So what is left is the economic interdependence that has the possibility to bind Asia together and to make it so unthinkable and expensive and unnecessary to have conflict. Remember, nobody wants conflict. Nobody in Europe wanted conflict in 1914. The point is if you create a system where a series of unintended effects can trigger political tensions which then make it difficult for countries to back down, that has consequences. I mean, if you look at what happens, it, we ha happened in the Senkaku or the Alu Islands uh, a few years ago, you can see that process. One ship, ca uh, one, one ship captain takes a boat in the wrong direction, somebody arrests him, somebody then demands he be released, and then that triggers a series of unintended consequences. So that's the ultimate prize of what we're talking about, which is how can ASEAN be made into something that is strong, 
knitted together, woven together, and has some of that prophylactic effect that the European Union has had in making war so unthinkable. I mean, it's now unthinkable that France and Germany would go to war, but remember, in 1945, France and Germany had gone to war three times in the preceding 70 years. Um, so these things can change very quickly, for the better or worse. I want to start by asking Uso Thane, the uh, you know, cabinet minister, but also works very closely with the president, a question about ASEAN's role in this respect. Uh, my friend Kishor Mabubani has often argued that ASEAN um, managed to have a heroic uh, success that we don't talk enough about in the way in which it was able to help integrate Myanmar. And his argument is that the Americans use sticks, uh, sanctions, punishments of all kinds, threats, but that ASEAN ap approached it very differently with Myanmar. And I want you to tell us, sir, do you agree with this? What was the role of ASEAN? How did you think about this process as you went through this extraordinary and still ongoing reform process that is taking place in Myanmar? So thank you. Thank you for uh, audience here. So for the, that question concerns, so you, you already know that the ASEAN since 1967 doing the, the as a model, model of the, you know, regional cooperation. So very patient and understand Asian culture. That's why we move as an ASEAN member and now you can see that reform is going on. Not like the uh, uh, Western country aspect. ASEAN, between ASEANs, they understand what Myanmar's culture and how to, you know, uh, re-engage and doing what, <clears throat> doing as the member, the, what you call, the quality members in the ASEAN group. That's the, this type of the, the model is the, our, you can see that that is the cooperation with the cooperation and coordination in the uh, members group. And also they can, we can, we, it will be shaped, shape our ASEANs in, in, within our uh, destiny and overcome future challenges ahead. That's the way we got the benefit from the joining the ASEAN. And we thank you for the ASEAN other members understand Myanmar. That's the way we are moving ahead. And now you know that we, uh, we can do, we got a chance to do the ASEAN chairmanships now. Absolutely. Um, Anthony Fernandez, let me ask you, um, when you look at this issue from the, the, the perspective of a private sector person, you, do you see the introduction of, you know, of, of Myanmar, do you see this as expansion of ASEAN in a sense as something that uh, creates a larger market, creates larger opportunities immediately? Or, I mean, you, you, know, you can't you can have too long-term a vision in business because you need to make money in the short term. Well, without a doubt. Um Myanmar inclusion into ASEAN is a benefit, and we at AirAsia, for instance, is taking advantage of it straight away. We already have nine flights uh, a day into Myanmar, uh, which was as soon as the country opened up, we were able from to- From where? From Bangkok and from Kuala Lumpur. So the market, by the inclusion of uh, Myanmar, has made ASEAN even bigger. Uh, you know, now we're reaching size of 700 million people. As I always say time and time again, Asia is not just about China and India. There's a phenomenal market in Southeast Asia named ASEAN, which has 700 million people and a fantastic consumption market out there, which we have been able to take advantage of. Sketch out for us the size of the, 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 the growth rates in the market. What is the most exciting thing happening? When you, because you, you're, in a sense, an interesting barometer mm. of what's, what's hot, what's growing. Where are you seeing greatest growth? Where have you seen some slowdowns? Well, really, consumption. You know, everyone will, the buzzword is emerging markets is a bad place to be, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't see any of it because the middle class is growing rapidly. The power to consume is immense. And you only have to look at our example. I started this airline 12 years ago with two planes. Uh, first year, 12 years ago, we had 200,000 passengers. 
over the last 12 years, we've grown to 150 planes, and now we're carrying 50 million passengers. The majority of those passengers come from within ASEAN, and we've created a lot of ASEAN connectivity and created an ASEAN tourism product as well. And I see it throughout some of my other businesses as well. Uh, people uh, want to be mobile. People want to consume. They want mobile phones, etc. And so I see the, the hot, the exciting things as consumption. Anything in a consumption mode, uh, the middle class is growing. It's a young population. And uh, we're a living example in a very tough business, the airline business, because it's so regulated, which means it's easier for the other uh, consumer products. And uh, do you feel you have pricing power to be profitable? But, and, and by that, I mean, do you have consumers who can pay enough to make this a viable proposition? Yeah, we're a low-cost airline. We, we survive on bringing a new market. We haven't been interested in cannibalizing anyone else's market. My, my argument to all the governments is give us airports that are cheap. We will stimulate a new market. Uh, the 50 million passengers that we have brought is a completely new market. Mm. Um, and uh, we have used pricing power. It's a classic economic theory of reducing fare and increasing the market. Gregory Domingo, let me ask you how you view this as an established member of ASEAN. Uh, does the increased size and, and commitment to ASEAN, does it do anything for you? I mean, you know, one of the things I wonder about sometimes is ASEAN ministers, they spend all their time meeting with one another. I mean, there's more, you know, ministerial ASEAN meetings held at golf courses in, in Southeast Asia <laughs> than, uh, than I think any, yeah, any hopefully other they're people. all flying on AirAsia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they should be, but my guess is they're flying Singapore Airlines first class. Uh, <laughs> Hope that changes after today. <laughs> but what does it do for you? What is, it, what, what is the benefit to a country like the Philippines? Well, the, right now, if you look at the, st the statistics in terms of, let's say, investments and in terms of uh, trade, the bulk of uh, trade by ASEAN is really with outside parties. I'm talking about trade with Japan, trade with China, trade with the United States, trade with the EU. And uh, r very little right now is really intra-ASEAN trade. But, but so the value right now from an ASEAN perspective is really the fact that as a group, we can negotiate better agreements with these big parties. Because if the Philippines were to negotiate, let's say by itself, a free trade agreement with uh, a big uh, global po economic power, uh, we'd get probably the short end of the stick. But with ASEAN as a group negotiating with the big powers, then we get a better deal. And as a result of that, you'll see that the growth of trade and investments for most of the ASEAN countries have really grown leaps and bounds since the creation of the ASEAN. James Riyadi, you're, you're sitting in the largest, you know, the largest pool of people. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the extraordinary emerging market, Indonesia, that has managed to, uh, to stabilize itself. If I think back to you know, the days after 9-11, after the Bali bombing, what people were concerned about with Indonesia was first it was going to fall apart, then it was going to be succumbing to jihadi uh, you know, movements. And what you have instead is a, a pretty stable country with a solid government, some reform. I would guess you'd say not enough. Um, what, is the, what is the potential for Indonesia with ASEAN? Because big countries are often the least interested in trade because they have a large internal market. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, I come from a business background. Uh, and uh, we have seen how over the last 50 years, uh, so much wealth have been created because of the shift of the production base from the United States to Japan to the Four Tigers, and in the last 20 years to the uh, Asian economies, the other Asian developing economies. And I think uh, the potential that ASEAN can generate with uh, cross uh, ASEAN uh, trade and investments would be very uh, substantial. Uh, so our group, uh, we've been, uh, we're based in Jakarta, but we are now in nine countries. And we have always uh, thought that we must expand all over Asia. And I think ASEAN, uh, ASEAN since 1967, has done a very good job to create a sense of uh, harmony and peace and so on, so that countries like Vietnam and Cambodia and now uh, 
uh, Myanmar can come into the fold and become a stronger part of the whole pie. Uh, we are particularly excited about Myanmar because now they've got 60 million people, mm. about, probably about $60 billion of, the, of, of GDP. But with the human resources and uh, natural resources, in the next 10 years, 15 years, uh, they, they could be 10 times bigger. So uh, we're quite excited about it. Indonesia has always played the, uh, the, the leadership role within ASEAN, and that has helped because with that kind of uh, positioning, uh, our government is always thinking also about not just Indonesia, but beyond Indonesia into the region. So that has also helped the business environment. Um, Phan Minh Binh, um, Vietnam occupies a very important and very strategic position in ASEAN. Gregory Domingo talked about how in ASEAN, one of the benefits of ASEAN is that you can negotiate collectively rather than individually. And I know, I think there's one country and one issue on, or a serious set of issues on which this has been a particularly interesting dynamic. The Chinese have generally speaking wanted to negotiate with each of you individually. And you have by and large resisted that and said no. We, we want multilateral negotiations where you are dealing with us collectively. Um, do you think you will be able to continue that policy? Because I know from being in Beijing two or three weeks ago that the Chinese certainly would very much, as they put it, they would very much appreciate if they could have more bilateral conversations with countries like Vietnam. I think your question is very tough. <laughs> <laughs> now to answer your questions, I had to come back to the principles of ASEAN. What factors make ASEAN strong? And what factors build the role of ASEAN? I think there are two uh, there are many factors, and one of the very important factors is that the unity of ASEAN and the centrality role of ASEAN. Why we say centrality role? Because we see in ASEAN there are several mechanisms. For example, ASEAN itself, ASEAN with its dialogue partners. Uh, for example, the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, that's on security issue. And ASEAN, or we can say the East Asia Summit, ASEAN and plus uh, now the uh, members of the East Asia Summit, about 18 members. And now we already established the ADMM, meaning ASEAN Defense Ministerium meeting, plus with the dialogue partners. In all this mechanism, ASEAN plays centrality role. So coming back to your question, ASEAN as a grouping, as Domingo say, we are strong if we negotiate as a group. Now with China, we are conducting the consultations on the uh, code of conduct coming from the previous one, the DOC, the declarations on the conducts of parties in South China Sea. And that is also between ASEAN and China. And now we come to the negotiation or consultations then negotiations with China on the code of conduct. So this is the ASEAN group with China. Yeah. And for example, South China Sea. It's, uh, South China Sea has uh, three dimensions. One dimension is that peace and stability in the region. The second issue is that that is navigation concerning to all countries around the world. And the third issue is the, the dispute over some areas in South China Sea. And the first two dimensions are related to all members of ASEAN and to its dialogue partners. So to maintain stability, we need a 
negotiation or uh, negotiation between ASEAN China for the dispute. That is, if there is a dispute between Vietnam and China, that's a bilateral negotiation. But for the Spanish Islands, it has uh, more than one country to claim mm -hmm. sovereignty over the Spanish Islands. So they need uh, concerned parties to negotiate. Uh, Gregory, you have mm -hmm. your country has had its own uh, recent uh, experience with China, mm -hmm. where the Chinese have decided a very clever strategy, it seems to me, of saying we're going to ease off on all these issues where we have been r rattling our neighbors. We're going to try to have goodwill. Uh, we're going to be more cooperative, except we're going to signal that if you get too far out of line, we're going to punish you. Mm -hmm. And the one country they have chosen for that, it seems to me, is the Philippines. Mm -hmm. They essentially canceled the visit of your, of your leader. Mm -hmm. What is going on? Explain to us. Now I'm a trade minister. I'm going to talk about foreign affairs, right? Uh, I hope the foreign affairs people in my country don't talk about trade policy. <laughs> but, uh, but the weapon they're using is trade. Yes. Um, well, uh, short answer. I don't yeah. want to really speak too much about uh, an area that uh, is not under me. But basically, the, the Philippine uh, position is we want to be friendly to all parties. And in the case of such a dispute, wherein the dispute is not bilateral, uh, wherein many parties are, inv are involved, uh, we prefer that it be done through legal means. Uh, and so that's why we've uh, filed uh, with the in it clause, the International Tribunal uh, on the Law of the Seas, uh, regarding that claim. So we'd like... Uh, we're hoping that uh, China participates in that uh, resolution. And do you, do you see any mechanism for ASEAN in this? Do you, any, any role for ASEAN? Uh, it's possible, but ASEAN has to choose to do it. Uh, although not, not all parties in ASEAN are involved in this uh, dispute. Let me ask about one other play, role that ASEAN can play, which is in liberalization and promoting reform. Uh, Uso Thin, do you feel that uh, uh, you, you, you are trying to do reforms in Myanmar? Is ASEAN, you know, what are the biggest obstacles you face and how can ASEAN help? So, for the reform concerns, uh, also the, all the ASEAN members gave assistance wherever they can. So, the, that's why within the two and a half years or three years, we move. Or what we are not expecting, the speed is too fast, but we are happy to do that. So that with the assistance of all these members state, that they want to give assistance and the, what I mean is the resource allocation and, you know, helping each other. For example, so sharing food, sharing fuel, sharing technologies, such kind of things, what we need, they are very welcome to do. At that moment, all the member states, like Indonesia, Malaysia, <coughs> Singapore, or Vietnam, all these things they give assistance in the capacity building in Myanmar. That is the most important challenges in Myanmar. Um, Farm Bin Min, if I can ask you, now that I ask Gregory about uh, foreign policy, I'm going to ask you about economic reform. <laughs> Ten years ago, people used to always tell me Vietnam is the next China. They're doing the same thing, special export zones, workforce is very motivated, they work very hard. Nobody says that anymore. There is a feeling that a reform process that had just seemed like it was going underway in, in Vietnam didn't quite go forward. And I know things have gotten better in the last year or two, but tell us what you think the difficulty of that process is and where could, you know, how could there be assistance um, in that process? Again, you put me on the wrong foot. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, we have undergone the economic reform, the reform in general, for more than 20 years. And we have gained successes in, uh, in, in this reform. And now, to the, to the new stage, we focus on the restructuring of the economy. Before our growth, 
based on the, we call the capital intensive and labor intensive investment. And now we try to go to the knowledge-based economy to restructure, restructure our economy in a way that we can have more efficient invest, investment. And that's, that is the way forward. We have the three breakthroughs in, uh, in our uh, reform. One is, is the restructure of the economy. The second one is we focus on the human resources. And the third one is we focus on the um, infrastructure building. So those are the main tasks for us. Go ahead. Um, James, when you look at the situation in Indonesia, what do you think were the challenges and do you think that the election could help resolve them? We're actually in a very extraordinary moment in the mm -hmm. emerging markets. Um, there are going to be, I think, what, six elections and basically all the major emerging markets are having elections this year. India, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, uh, South Africa, Colombia. It's, it's an extraordinary situation and what historically has always happened is the first six or eight months after an election are usually good for the economy because generally political parties pander the, 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 the year before the election. The year after the election, the ruling party feels as its opportunity to, to make some of the hard changes. Do you think that will happen, especially if this governor wins? Actually, the, the election this year, the legislative and the presidential election, uh, are actually uh, reasons for us to be uh, optimistic because since 1998, We've had so many uh, provincial, regional, and national elections, and they've all gone very smoothly. And so it is actually a celebration of democracy in Indonesia, and that is the kind of democracy that has brought Indonesia today uh, to be a global economy, uh, just about a, a $1 trillion uh, economy. And so uh, we think that this election will go very smoothly. Uh, we think that it will provide a stronger foundation uh, to take advantage of more reforms, uh, so that the, you know, we don't get caught in the middle income trap, uh, that there, there'll be more breakthroughs coming up. Uh, we, we are very hopeful that uh, new, newer faces and younger faces will come out. So we are quite excited about it. And I think you were talking about reforms. I think from the business community, uh, I think we need to have a measured uh, approach, not only thinking about having trade packs with you know, China and, and Japan and all these, these other countries, I think there should be more reforms in the individual countries. I think that's, that's still the, the biggest problems that business people are facing. What kind of reforms would you like to see in Indonesia? Uh, I think uh, fundamentally, uh, philosophically, is that whole idea that the solution of all of a so society's problem, whether it's economic problems, social, uh, education, healthcare, and so on, is not bigger government and, and more regulations, but the empowering of the, of, the, of the marketplace, empowering of the people. And I think this philosophical uh, idea that it's not the government that's gonna make things happen, uh, this needs to have a, a, a basic uh, mindset change. Because once they think that it is the government that can provide all the solutions, there'll be just more and more regulations. Uh, uh, and so we are in eight countries. Uh, if you ask many business people, our biggest, uh, concerns are regulations and what the, the government will do to, to block what we're trying to do. Um, Tony Fernandez, so speak to this issue because it strikes me looking at your career that you went from one of the most unregulated industries in the world to one of the most regulated. I mean, you used to be the head of Warner Music, right? I mean, music, it strikes me as a, you know, almost total free-for-all, which is why Napster could come in and essentially steal your your music and nobody seemed to, to mind. Which is why I left. Which is now. <laughs> and now you've gone to a situation where, you know, you have this very strange industry where, I mean, I look at South Asia where I grew up, you know, it, how can you be profitable as an air, private airline when the state of India, government of India has not just one, but two airlines. Pakistan has a state airline. Bangladesh has a state airline. Nepal has a state airline. You know, and, that, and they keep all the, 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 the key landing slots and the key uh, places in airports. So how do you operate in this world? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, um, to be honest. Is but it getting better? It's getting better. It's getting better. I mean, I started in Malaysia 
we have an airline in Thailand, we have an airline in Indonesia, we have an airline in the Philippines, and uh, God willing, we'll have one in India very soon, and uh, Japan as well. That would have been unheard of. Now, you know, we kind of, uh, airlines are so nationalistic, uh, it's almost like you're carrying the, the country's flag. Why do you think that is? It's interesting, right? That com- countries no longer think they need to have a national steel company. Yeah. But every country thinks that as an article of faith, it must have a state-owned airline. It's something that I'm doing my level best <laughs> to try and persuade governments that you don't need to have a national carrier. But it is. It, it, you know, they constantly lost, lose money. Yeah. Um, but because it has the country's name on it, there's almost that uh, infection. But it's changing. It's changing. The fact is we've created something that's ASEAN. And uh, I see a lot of regulations now uh, becoming much more proactive. I mean, we're pushing this whole ASEAN uh, reform scenario. We're saying, let's have one regulation. Let me take it in my industry. Uh, rather than have pilots who have 10 different exams to pass in 10 different countries or 10 different air traffic controls, isn't it easier for business if we had one regulation, and one ASEAN regulation? Um, and I'm sure many industries feel that same way. And so we're pushing that, that process of ownership and one regulation and creating a much larger market between them. So it's tough. It isn't easy. And I'll tell you a funny story. I mean, as you go through, um, when we, when we, you know, occasionally as ASEAN countries have some little differences. I was once with the president of Indonesia who said, you know, Tony, what if we go to war with Malaysia? Who will AirAsia support? I said, sir, very simple. AirAsia Indonesia will move the Indonesian soldiers to war and AirAsia Malaysia will bring the Malaysian soldiers to fight them. Uh, we are truly ASEAN in uh, more ways than one. But I mean, you know, we joke about it, but it is also tough sometimes for an ASEAN company to build a business within ASEAN. But the reform has started, and I believe that private industry has to change it. I, I share my view very much with James that uh, we can't wait for governments Private industry has to push governments. I think we had a fantastic uh, meeting this morning where actually the best statement came from the Malaysian trade minister who said, having heard all of this, I thought we were doing very well, but actually there's a lot more that needs to be done. And so the consultative approach, I think, has always been just ministers talking to each other. And I think this morning was actually encouraging to see business talking to ministers as well and... uh, uh, trying to find a win-win situation. Trust is important in ASEAN. Uh, right now, every country thinks, do I win by having a single market? Do I lose? I think the, the goal is very simple. Everyone will win, uh, whether you're the, a big country or a small country, by having a common market of 700 million people, every person in that market will benefit. Um, let's uh, take your questions. I, I only ask that you um, identify yourself. You ask a uh, question of a specific person, only one, uh, and that the question, in fact, be a question. Uh, If you would like to make a speech, at some point the the forum will decide to invite you on the panel, (laughs) but this is is not that occasion. (laughs) I chair the Global Agenda Council uh, on Southeast Asia for the uh, World Economic Forum. Um, I, I, I take the point about uh, the engagement of business with, with government. In fact, I think uh, many of the members of an organization which we formed in order to do that are, are here in this room today. But um, all that is necessary. But I'd like to put this question to the, to the panel, right, or, or have the panel address what is it, actually an existential question for ASEAN. It's great we do all these things, but is it enough? The point is, ASEAN is like this sort of sepat takro club, you know, like a little cottage industry where the task ahead of it um, is of geopolitical scale, right? So it was formed a certain time ago uh, with a, a sort of a limited mandate. It now has a huge mandate to form an economic region at a time when things aren't keeping still. There are the, there's the TPP negotiation going on. Uh, there's RCEP, right? There are, there are huge plans around ASEAN, walls of money from both Japan and China, right, waiting to come into ASEAN. And meanwhile, there's this dithering around an old consultative method. So um, I'd like to address, uh, you know, Sure, so why don't we ask that to the Vietnamese Deputy Prime Minister? Um, The question is simple. You you hear there's this changing geopolitics, changing geoeconomics, uh, and ASEAN, is it becoming a smaller part 
uh, and less relevant as the East Asian summit, as all these TPP things happen? You know that uh, in uh, ASEAN will become the uh, community by 2015. And that, that is the, a large market of 600 million people. And the, we promote the inter-integration, or we call the connectivity within ASEAN. At the same time, we also promote the integrations with its partners outside. In 2012, we, uh, have, we, ag we agreed to establish the Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership with uh, six other countries, namely China, Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, and New Zealand. It would create a market of three, more than three billion people, including India, sorry. Then half of the populations of the world and one third of the uh, GDP of the world. So that is the expansion of integration, not only within ASEAN, but between ASEAN with other countries. And ASEAN also has some negotiations to establish FTA with EU, with uh, already have the uh, FTA with China. And individual countries in ASEAN also conducting the negotiations on FTA with other countries, with, with other grouping. For example, Vietnam is conducting six FTA negotiations. TPP is the one with the European Union, the other with South Korea and some other countries. So this is the status in ASEAN. Uh, other questions? Sir. Thank you for it. Uh, my name is Nandu. I'm the Nestle Executive Director responsible for Africa and Asia. My question is from Secretary Domingo and has to do with ASEAN uh, intra-ASEAN trade and speaks to the points made by Tony and pa James about regulations. My question very specifically today, one of the things that restricts intra-ASEAN trade is the multiplicity of non-tariff regulatory barriers, such as multiple halal registrations by the MUI in each country, such as multiple FDA registrations by each country individually. I know you're working on this in the ASEAN Council of Ministers, and I know that this, these discussions have run, run into roadblocks. In your perspective, in what time frame could we see some harmonization of these non-tariff uh, barriers? I, I think uh, some of them should be resolved quite quickly. Um, but as you're resolving them, some others crop up, new ones. So uh, I don't think you can set a time frame as to when all of them will be completed. But we, this has been identified, not only in ASEAN, actually, but in almost all of the trade fora, WTO included. Uh, this is actually a very big issue uh, now. And so special committees, task forces have been formed to address this particular problem. And ASEAN is on that as well. We, there, there are several reasons uh, for the low volume of intra-ASEAN trade, not only NTBs. Uh, it also speaks of the rules uh, that are not uh, easy for, for example, for SMEs to participate because, and again, this problem is not unique to ASEAN. It's also true in WTO because most of the trade rules are really geared for big corporations. Uh, so where we, they have their accountants and lawyers that will fill up the forms, uh, rules of origin, etc. Uh, but for SMEs, it becomes very cumbersome that very few SMEs will actually avail of it. And a lot, there are a lot of SMEs within ASEAN. So if we address these issues as well for the SMEs in terms of 
uh, putting the minimis rules make it really easy for them to uh, for Thailand uh, export SME exporters to send to Indonesia, etc., and vice versa. Then I think we can see the intra-ASEAN trade grow by leaps and bounds. Uh, so that's that's one of the things that we're focusing now as well on ASEAN is to address the. SME problem, but the NTBs, the non-tariff barriers, definitely is very high on the agenda. We're always discussing that now and tr trying to move forward. Anyone else? Let me ask um, one of our members of the audience, since I notice he happens to be here, Kishore Mabubani, uh, to answer the first question, which I'll rephrase this way, which is, can ASEAN deal with the very uh, large geopolitical challenges that it faces, uh, which are really the rise of China, the desire of China to have really independent bilateral relations with each of its, uh, of its neighbors and not deal with ASEAN as a group, uh, the rise of TPP and the desire for the United States to try and create a larger trade group. In other words, these are these larger giants that are playing around, and here's ASEAN, can it negotiate? Give us, describe the situation for us. Thank, thank you, Farid. I thought I was going to sneak in. Uh, I, I thought I was going to sneak into this meeting quietly, but I hope I, do, I hope you don't mind if I give you a very optimistic answer, uh, because clearly the geopolitical, geopolitical rivalry between U.S. and China, China and Japan, to some extent within China and India, will rise. That's a given, and I'm absolutely certain that they'll be doing more in terms of competing with one another. And it is conceivable there's at least a 20 to 30% chance that ASEAN could be torn apart and could break in the next 10 years. That's also conceivable. But the likelihood is that, and, and this, is, this reflects, I guess, my personal judgment on the basis of working with the policymakers who actually make the policies in ASEAN, whether it's in Delhi or Beijing or Tokyo or Washington, D.C., that they realize that ASEAN is an amazing geopolitical asset for them, and ASEAN actually provides the geopolitical platform which enables them to meet each other in a way that they cannot meet each other bilaterally. I mean, for example, the Chinese and Japanese have great difficulty arranging bilateral meetings, but when they come to an ASEAN meetings, they have a lot of side meetings, and that reduces the tension between China and Japan, as it happens once in Vietnam, by the way, uh, when they couldn't talk to each other. So the likelihood is that, if I'm a betting man, there's a 70% probability that ASEAN will benefit enormously from this geopolitical competition because everybody is now coming to the table with real, how do you say, real material benefits. These are not paper agreements, okay? If you look at what Asia, China is offering ASEAN, it's very real stuff, whether it's infrastructure development, loans, credits, and so on and so forth. The Japanese are now matching. And that alone means that that's a tremendous boost to ASEAN already. So you'll see high-speed railways, infrastructure, and all coming as a result of this geopolitical competition. And I think once India settles itself, India will come in too. And as you know, the United States has also made it a priority. And the good news is that if both RCEP succeed and TPP succeed, and I think it's conceivable that both will succeed, it's not a zero-sum game. Because many of them, like Vietnam and Singapore, are members of both the TPP and the RCEP process. And we'll benefit from both. And so will many others. So I, I'm not sure what the tenor of your earlier discussion was, but I hope at least I want to make everyone feel very optimistic about ASEAN. And, 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 and also, by the way, sorry, I hope to write a book on this in the next year. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we always do, just hope that the World Economic Forum will be given credit for your, uh, for your inspiration. So we started by wondering about questions of war and conflict. We've ended with uh, Kishore telling us not to worry the great uh, Southeast Asian middle class is going to save the world. Thank you all very much.